Richard, firstly, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us. You uh, describe yourself as being in 1983 the founder of the free software movement. Exactly what is all that? The first thing you need to make a computer do anything is an operating system. If you haven't got an operating system, it won't run at all. And at that time, all the operating systems for modern computers were proprietary software. That means non-free software. The users were kept divided and helpless. So I was an operating system developer, and I said, I'm going to change this. I couldn't convince countries, governments to change these disgusting laws. I couldn't change, convince companies to change their policies, but I could write software. So I said, I'm going to write another operating system with the help of anyone I can convince to help me. And this operating system is going to respect users' freedom. It's going to give people a way to use computers in freedom. And this operating system, I gave the name GNU. So in January 1984, I started developing the GNU operating system. And by the early 90s, we had almost all the pieces necessary, but one important piece was missing, which was the kernel, the, the component, the program that allocates the computer's resources to all the other programs that you use. And at that point, Linus Torvalds wrote a kernel called Linux, and in 1992, he made it free software. So at that point, Linux filled the last gap in the GNU system, and the combination which was basically GNU with Linux added, started becoming popular, and so we achieved our goal. We made it possible to use a computer in freedom. But as this combined GNU plus Linux system became popular and millions of people started using it, the idea of freedom got lost for most of them. Most of them started saying, here's this really exciting operating system. It's powerful, it's reliable, and you can get it cheap, and you can learn all about it, and you can do what you like. It's, it's really cool. But they didn't tell other people that this is the way you can live in freedom. So that began to be forgotten by most of our community, not everybody. However, as that proceeded, in 1998, some of the people who didn't think very much about freedom as a goal, they started describing our software in another way. They started calling it open source as a way they could talk about our software in our community without mentioning freedom as an issue. So today, the free software movement is still here. There are more of us than there were before, of course, but there are now tens of millions of people using our work who don't know why we did it. So today our main work actually is talking to the people who already use our software and already know how good it is and explaining to them that this is more than just a powerful, reliable system. It's actually a way you can live in freedom and have the freedom to form a community and help other people too. So a lot of people say free software is open source, but not necessarily all open source software is free. Um, talk, tell us a bit more through, with regards to your feelings with regards to the whole idea of open source. Well, I don't really like to talk very much about open source. It's a shallower view of the work that we do where we say that software must, ethically must, respect your freedom and respect specifically your freedom to cooperate with other people and as a community take control of your computers. They just say that if people let you look at the source code and change it, it'll make the software technically better. Well, that may be true, but it's less important. Imagine people arguing about whether free elections where everyone's allowed to vote would be better or worse for the economy. They're missing the point. They might come to the right conclusion. You know, They might support free elections where everyone's allowed to vote. Even so, their arguments would be weak ones. And if we let such important things rest on mere economics, mere short-term practicality, that means, means we've lost sight of what's really important. What would you say to people who don't want to use the term free because it implies free of charge? I mean, take Microsoft who say, yeah, free like a puppy. What's your opinion on that? They're just being silly. You know, 
people are well aware that free software means free as in free speech, not free as in free beer. It only takes about three seconds to say that to people, and it isn't hard for them to understand. Now, I've discovered that most people who hear the term open source misunderstand it. The official definition of open source by the people who started that, that way of talking about things is pretty similar to the definition of free software. It's not written the same way and it's interpreted by different people so they've drawn the line at different places. But it's, it was meant to be more or less similar to the definition of free software. But you'll find that most people seem to think only that, that it means only that you can look at the source code. Now that's a much weaker criterion and it's a really dra drastic misunderstanding. So I hope that in your show you'll help correct that misunderstanding, but it's really much clearer to tell people free software. It's true that there's a misunderstanding they could have, but that misunderstanding is qualitatively totally different from the right understanding. So it's really easy to point out to people which one's the right meaning and which one's the wrong meaning, and once they've thought that through, they won't get confused. I happened to watch a couple of days ago uh, the one movie which uh, you appeared in, Revolution OS. And there was one thing which I wanted to talk to you about where uh, with regards to the homebrew computing um, journal, the, 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 that one aspect in, the, in that DVD, and it referred to how when Bill Gates wrote an open letter into homebrew, he said that how on earth do you expect to make money out of this? You know, as a programmer, you'd, you, you, you'd study for this and you're making the equivalent of $2 an hour. I don't think it's an important question. I don't really concern myself with how much or how little money Bill Gates makes. All I'll observe is that he has enough money to know where his next few million meals are coming from, so really it doesn't seem to matter. But basically, this is why would we be concerned about this question? There's a whole implicit chain of reasoning that they expect you to to rush through in your head without looking at it carefully. So let's look at it slowly so we can see where its weaknesses are. They first expect you to assume that unless people are well paid to write software, they won't do it. That's where their assumption starts. So then they expect us to want to have lots of software and that's all we want, they assume. We don't care if that software respects our freedom or takes away our freedom, just as long as it's there and it runs. That's the second assumption. So then, if, we, if those two assumptions are true, if that's really what one factual and one assumption about what we want, then we would get to the conclusion that in order to have more software, we should give up our freedom so that the developers of software can have power over us and make us pay them a lot of money, and then we'll have software We'll have given up our freedom, but we don't care about that. We just have software we can run. Well, the first of these assumptions is factually false. There are about a million developers of free software now. And we're developing lots of software. So that assumption is false. Now, the second assumption is about what our values are. And, of course, your values could be different from my values. But I'll just tell you that my values are... I don't want software if it doesn't respect my freedom. In fact, I so much don't want it that I won't take it. If somebody offers me a program, but only on the condition that I promise I will not share it with you, then I'm going to tell him no. I'm going to tell him that to be a good neighbor, I have to refuse that software, and I will refuse it. So these two assumptions are both wrong. And the free software community's success proves how wrong they are. In South Africa, we have quite a big problem with regards to software piracy. People copying proprietary software oh, I illegally. Don't think so. I, really, I really don't think so. Piracy is attacking ships, and I don't think that they do it with software. And it, I haven't heard it's very rampant in the area of South Africa. In the Caribbean and in uh, Southeast Asia, I believe those are the big hotspots hot for piracy. And it's a really bad thing. The pirates kill the entire crews of the ships that they attack. So that's a very bad thing. Uh. But sharing copies of software is everybody's natural right. And nobody should ever take that away.
The problem you have is not that people are 